Earlier this fall, the mayors of Toronto and Ottawa got new powers from the province as part, they say, of Ontario's bid to get housing built more quickly. Now there's a new bill to make those so-called strong mayor powers even more powerful, along with major changes to regional governments. With us now on what these measures could mean, let's welcome Josh Matlow, City Councillor for Ward 12, that's Toronto St. Paul's. Karen Stintz, who's a former Toronto City Councillor. Luca Bucci, former Chief of Staff to the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. He's now the Chief Executive Officer of the Ontario Home Builders Association. Eric Lombardi is founder of the housing advocacy group More Neighbours Toronto. And Alex Pearson, AM640 radio host of the eponymously named Alex Pearson Show. It's great to have everybody around the table here. You for the first time, I mm -hmm. think. This is I made it. I really feel like I made it. A couple of Hamiltonians. Yeah. Yeah. Here. Do I tell them that you ment mentored me at one point? No? You could. Yeah. I, I think it's a bit late okay. if you didn't want to say it because you've said it now. <laughs> there you go. I got to do a full disclosure thing, and uh, that is because Luke is here with the Home Builders Association, and I got a brother who's a home builder. That's right. Who builds homes in the uh, Hamilton, Halton, and I think some Niagara region as well. So we put that on the table for everybody's full disclosure. Josh, you first. Let's just clarify what has happened here. Initially, the province intended to give the mayors of Toronto and Ottawa, these so-called strong mayor powers, and then they sort of put that on steroids. So tell everybody now, what is all this, what are the new powers that have you concerned? Well, I think it's really important to understand both what this is about and also equally what this is not about. So I don't think any of us, and certainly no one on this panel, would disagree that housing has to be a top priority for every government uh, in this country, um, because we are in a bona fide housing crisis. What uh, Bill 3 and certainly Bill 39 does not do is address housing in any way, shape or form. Now I disagreed with Bill 3 which provided some stronger mayor powers to John Tory and would have with Mayor Sutcliffe in Ottawa, although he rejected those, uh, mm -hmm. those gifts. Um, but I recognize that you know, veto powers, uh, appointments to committees, stuff like that, is, there is a precedent in the United States, so we, I think reasonable people who believe in democracy can debate those powers. What Bill 39 does is something unprecedented in any elected legislative body in the world. Toronto, given that John Tory secretly requested these powers during the municipal election that Doug Ford agreed to, would become the only elected body in the world that can pass resolutions by minority rule, meaning that that is the antithesis of democracy. Now, I believe that we need to expedite and make sure that we focus our attention on housing, on transit, on all the priorities in the world uh, that are important to the citizens of this city and this province. But I think any reasonable person would agree that we should at least remain a democratic body. And that is what John Tory and Doug Ford have done. They have actually diminished the role mm. of councillors, diminished the voices of communities, and have now created something that I think should uh, worry anyone who believes in democracy in this country, which is now there's a precedent in Toronto for minority rule. A third of council, along with the mayor, can make a decision about any matter that the mayor deems to be in provincial interest over the opinion of the majority, which is unheard of. So if Bill 39 passes, that's what the new Ontario will look like. And I want to get some reaction around the table as to what we think about that. You used to be on council. Yes. Could you live under this new proviso? Well, there would be a you know, big question about why would you have councillors if you're going to do this. And uh, I, I agree with Councillor Matlow. I, you know, I think this new piece of legislation is troublesome because I, it's, the underpinning of it is that it will build more housing. It won't build more housing. What it will do, it will concentrate power. And we talk about democracy as if it's um, some Thing to the side of us that we really shouldn't pay much attention to, but the reality is democracies are built inherent within every democracy is a check and balance system. And what's been created right now is a power, uh, a decision-making body with zero check on its power. And that should be troubling for this existing mayor, and it should be troubling for this existing premier, because what he's done is not time-based. What he's done is forever change the makeup of how decisions are made in the largest city in this country and it will effectively be made by a gang of eight and the mayor. And that, that, should worry, that should worry everybody. You say it should worry everybody, but I think it probably doesn't worry Luca. Well, let's look, at, let's look at some facts here, right? Everybody in the city of Toronto has an opportunity to vote for the mayor. City councillors are elected by a small portion 
of the city based on their neighborhood or jurisdiction or area of jurisdiction. And what the legislative legislation does, it primarily focuses these new powers on matters of provincial priority. And right now, the only matter of provincial priority that have been identified through the regulation is housing. So you have a mayor who has been democratically elected by the entire city on an agenda who, that is focused on growth and, and you know, building homes, um, working with the province on a priority issue that is front and center of the political agenda. So I would argue it's, it's not as undemocratic as people might think because there is an opportunity for people when the mayor comes into an election period to vote for his mandate. And that is consistent across the city. And again, these powers are specifically focused right now on matters of housing. And to be honest, the city of Toronto doesn't really have a great reputation when it comes to moving housing priorities forward. Um, you know, last year, you know, this isn't, sorry, this isn't just exclusive to market housing, it's also applicable to affordable housing. Last year, the city of Toronto came to the government to get a zoning order for an affordable housing project that was funded through the Rapid Housing Initiative, which is a federal pro pro program um, that gives money for capital costs of construction of affordable housing projects. Um, this project was at Cummer Avenue in North York. Um, the municipal process didn't lend itself to the timelines that were set by the federal government for this funding. Um, and then the municipality was left going to the province to fast track the process. Through these new powers, the mayor can take it upon himself to use you know, mechanisms within uh, city council, mechanisms within city government to get those projects online more quickly. So it, I, I would argue it really isn't an undemocratic practice. You have a democratically elected mayor setting priorities that are based off of a mandate that he took to the people of Toronto on a matter that is top of mind for the majority of people, not only in the city, but in this province. Okay, Josh, I know you're champing at the bit to get in there. Mm -hmm. I see you shaking your head, but let me get everybody for one response first. Where are you on this? Uh, you know, I have a reasonably in the middle opinion on this because, you know, the way I see it, we have two issues. One is we have a housing crisis in this province and time and time again, we see that no level of government is really willing to be accountable to solving this issue, despite the fact that many of the levels of government have within their purview the tools to solve this crisis. When it comes to the strong mayor powers that are being granted to John Tory, everything that the province can expect John Tory to do, the province could also do instead. And so it bears the question of, why doesn't the province actually make these legislative changes that are desperately needed across the region because it's not just a Toronto problem anymore? So that's really one fact. But there is a second fact here in that municipal councils across the province are not really being held accountable to what I would call democratic outcomes. And I think we can see that the fact that the municipal level of government is becoming increasingly irrelevant in the days, in the lives of people in this province. You look at voter turnout not even one third bother to show up. And I think there is a reasonable question to ask about, for the mayor in particular, the only citywide elected office, with the, the only one with a citywide mandate, what ability should they have to see an agenda <coughs> through in their term? I think the biggest problem is not that municipal government is delivering. It, we need dramatic reforms to make it operate much better. But what we've been deprived of is a debate on what the future of municipal government looks like and how to actually systematically change things such that we actually see outcomes that are democratic in nature. And a perfect example of this is on the vote on rooming houses that you know, we continue to punt to study because council cannot get it done. Can and, I can I do a quick follow up with you here? Yeah. Are, my guess is, are you the only tenant here on this uh, of this group? I'm actually not a tenant. You're not a tenant? No. You live in a home that you own? Yes, I own my condo. Wow, good for you. I thought yeah. so. You're a young guy who managed to uh, buy some property in this town. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I did, and I'm incredibly fortunate. You know, I I both had family help, and I have the privilege of working in the technology sector, which is one of the few um, areas people my age can you know, be able to afford what was once possible to a middle class person. But for me, advocacy is so important because I see so many of my friends who went into totally normal middle class professions who've seen the latter in a very short period of time totally pulled up upon them. And the urgency at the political level, which is dominated by people who aren't feeling this as much themselves, is just not there. And when we're talking about housing as an issue, the reality is we have not seen accountability from anyone. And it's just hot potato passing between every level of government because no one 
at the end of the day, wants to be caught holding the bag and things keep getting worse. Okay, we got two and two here so far. Alex Pearson, you get to break the tie. Mm -hmm. Where are you on this? For me, it's an issue of transparency. You know, we were in an election, and I don't have fundamentally a problem with the mayor of the biggest city in the country getting more powers. I mean, we've seen it in other cities, we've seen it in America, we've seen it in Europe. So I don't have fundamentally a problem with more powers. What I have a problem with, and I think what the electorate has a problem with, is finding out after the fact. Mm -hmm. Is finding out, well, just trust me. Well, no, you don't ask for the trust after the fact. You build that trust before <laughs> and take it to the electorate. I mean, John Tory likely would have very much still won with the same amount of votes. But you can't come out after the fact and tell people this is how it's done and this is what we're going to do and then just say, trust me. We've seen too many times at every level, whether it's the federal government with the EA Act, whether it's the provinces using the notwithstanding clause, and now we've got these backroom deals. And I think over time, people turn around and say, why should I trust you? You can't get stuff done when we elect you to do it. And so what, you wield out these powers and these backroom deals to get stuff done? doesn't sit well, and it shouldn't sit well. For, so for me, it's a transparency issue. We actually had two elections this year. Yeah. We had a provincial election in June mm -hmm. on which this was not campaigned on, yeah. and a municipal election in yeah. October in which this was not campaigned on. So you got a problem in both cases. Well, I have cases. a problem because I have a radio show. So an election, <laughs> I a problem, and, and we would talk about these issues. Like, I would have talked about this. This was yeah. one of those, I mean, Toronto's election was a very consequential election. The city's not run very well. We have a huge budget over. Um, shortfall. We've got red, dead raccoons that you can't get picked up. We've got potholes you can't get filled. We've got the housing crisis and, and, and. So there's a lot of crime. And yet, you know, no one really talked about it. And no one talked about the elephant in the room that no one knew existed. So I promise you, this would have been talked about had anyone known. Did you want to go back to that issue that I saw you shaking your head about a few I, minutes I, ago? No, I, I appreciate that because you know, my, my friend Luke has, you know, suggested even <clears> that, 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 you know, the Cummer uh, uh, affordable housing modular housing issue. The reality of that, as you may remember, is that actually the local councillor at the time supported it. It was the MPP, the Conservative Correct. MPP, that who did didn't. And it was actually one of the few instances where the government did not award uh, a ministerial zoning, a zoning order to push it through. So in fact, yet again, to Eric's point, the Ford government, like any provincial government, if they wanted to upzone neighborhoods tomorrow, if they wanted to approve that, in other words, they can do whatever they want. They could change uh, the, the name of Toronto to Ford Nation if they chose to, although please don't share that suggestion because it might happen. And the reality is, the government of Ontario is not actually acting on the hyperbole and the rhetoric that they're expressing about housing. And now we are caught in this sort of gaslighting, uh, red herring debate about a strong mayor power that should not be used by any democracy. So, um, you know, I, I only want to just correct the record about how that sort of happened. Ultimately, and by the way, to Eric's point earlier, uh, yes, it was a shameful low turnout in the municipal election, but as it was with the provincial election too. Uh, it was actually an unprecedented low turnout in the provincial election, which is, again, another matter about the health of our democracy. But what John Tory and Doug Ford did further hurts and diminishes our democracy. It actually tells people that your voice doesn't matter, your elected representative's voice doesn't matter, and yes, John Tory has a mandate of the entire city, but collectively, the city council does too, together. And we Although are Although he got to, more votes than all of you put together. And I had a higher margin. <laughs> I mean, you know, we can compare these things. The reality is that we elect a council to Karen's point, that there should be a check and balance. Uh, it doesn't, you know, it's not long in our history where we can, you know, recount Rob Ford's tenure as mayor. And under, you know, and actually, you know, Karen, Karen at times, um, when it came to transit and other important priorities to us, if she and we didn't have the majority of votes, to contest when Rob Ford wanted to just completely destroy Transit City or other matters, we wouldn't have been able to keep him in check. And when he went through, um, you know, a, a sensational episode where our democracy, the function of our city was at question, it was because he didn't have this minority rule power that the majority of council was able to keep, you know, you can argue how well it was done, but at least keep, you know, keep the machine moving. But Karen, let me circle back to something you said, which was, and the whole point we are told of this new law is that it's the only way to get houses built, enough houses built, without all of the nimbyism and other obstacles that get in the way. And you said, no, it won't. 
It absolutely how do you, won't. How do you but know that it won't get more homes built? I can guarantee you it won't get any more homes built. But the other thing that I find just delightful is that the last time I was on your show in person, we were debating the reduction of council from 45 to 25. And the theory was it would make council run so much more efficiently. Well, it's running so much more efficiently, now it actually <laughs> needs to be eight, yeah. right? So on its face, that argument has zero merit. Houses are being built all over the city all the time, every day. John Tory used to tout that we had the most cranes in North America building housing in our city. And that's why you can't go down any street without running into construction. So the entire notion that we need these powers to get housing built is nonsense, just complete nonsense. The issue with Cummer, that, wouldn't, that would not have been fixed with any intervention of a strong mayor, none. That was a bureaucratic response. And as Josh pointed out, Councillor Matlow pointed out, the council was in favor. Council was in favor. It was the local MPP who was not. And who carried the day. And who yeah. carried the day. Now, to your point, will more housing get built? No. There's approved housing today that has been canceled because of interest rates. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when we look at what's happening in the green belt, the land purchases that have been happening over the last couple of weeks in advance of this announcement, nobody pays $50 million at an interest rate of 23% to build housing. Mm -hmm. And that's what is happening. There is no affordable housing that will come out of this at all. If the government was serious about affordable housing, they would have bought the land in the green belt. They could have purchased it and actually built affordable housing. They didn't. So there's a lot of people that are winning. It's not going to be people who need housing. I, Go ahead. I think there are a lot of misconceptions in, in this argument, right? Because you know, I hear this as a housing advocate all the time. Oh, look at all the cranes. They're building so much housing. But the fact is that we have such intensity in the scale of these buildings is actually a lot more expensive to build than wood-framed housing in neighborhoods. And so the fact that a lot of these projects are penciling out actually speaks to the fact that the policies in place do not facilitate the creation of housing in the places people want to be living at a reasonable price. And yes, the government actually has a huge impact on both the soft costs of housing projects and the hard costs, materials and labor, because Supply chains cannot reorient themselves to deliver things or deliver more housing more frequently if the regulatory environment doesn't exist such that the risk is going to be worthwhile. And so when we talk about these stronger mayor powers, do I think that they're healthy for our democracy? No. Do I think they were the right reform on municipal government? No. I'm a strong proponent of having municipal po po political parties because at least that way there can be some form of citywide mandate that includes the councillors. But, you know, we see on last council, you know, we could not legalize literally having roommates in, you know, three quarters of our land area. And, you know, to me, that is something that would absolutely get done under this new rule. Well, let me pick up on that if I can. I'll go to you on this, Alex, because again, this is the explanation the provincial government has given. Mm -hmm. There's too much nimbyism. There are too many councillors who don't want to see gentle increases in density in their wards, mm -hmm. so the explanation goes. And therefore, we need to have it in such a way where the mayor and third council can get together and that's enough. Do you buy that argument? No. I don't buy anything any politician says anymore because we've well. seen... To, no, I don't because... We get the talk, we don't get the walk. It's not enough to have the headlines in the news all the time about what we're going to do. Do it. The calls I get from people are, I don't want to hear about it anymore, I just want to see it, get it done. So when we hear about these announcements of the strong mayor powers, we're going to get all this housing built, we're talking three or four years before a shovel even goes in the ground because it has to be planned, the municipalities are going to have to deal with the infrastructure. Nothing's going to be built overnight. And what people are being filled with is this this hope of something that's not going to exist for many, many years. And we're so far behind. And, and I mean, frankly, you know, with StatsCan coming out and warning, by the way, there's six million people coming to the province of Ontario over the next two decades. I mean, where have they been? What have people been doing? What is the Win McGuinty government? What have all these governments been doing while they're announcing all the housing that never seems to get built, ever? Like, <laughs> we get the announcements, we don't get the housing. Let me pluck something out of that and put it to Luca, which <clears> is, one of the other criticisms we're hearing about this is that the servicing of the land that is now going to be built on, which maybe wasn't intended to be built on before, is, you know, we're talking about sewers, we're talking about hydro, we're talking about all the things you've got to do to service land to make, to make it eligible for people to live there. That's going to cost municipalities untold amounts of money going down the road, which has not been taxpayers. factored... Taxpayers. Taxpayers, you're right, exactly. Which has not been factored into any of this. Is that a fair comment? Um, 
With respect to the strong Marib's powers, is that what you're you're asking? Well, the fa the fact that they're going to be able to start building, not not their words, my words, right. I guess, willy nilly in all sorts of places, <laughs> which wasn't allowed before, right. is going to require a lot of servicing of land that was un otherwise unanticipated, mm -hmm. and municipal taxpayers will have to pay for that. And there's no provision in any of the provincial legislation to account for that. Um, that's a good question, and. I thought so too. It's a great question. <laughs> um, and, and I think, you know, when we're, looking at, when we're looking at where houses are going to be built and how houses are going to be built, you know, we have to kind of appreciate that there's still elements of input from both municipality and, you know, local constituents on how these units are going to come online and how servicing to these units are going to be, um, for lack of a better term, financed or, or, or attributed to that housing project, right? So despite the fact that you're increasing powers to a mayor or despite the fact that the province is coming in um, and restructuring the way that development charges happen, there's still an element of local decision making, making that is embedded in that process where um, local constituents, local councillors are going to have an opportunity to tell uh, municipal decision makers, whether it's on the, the side of the um, city staff or on the side of the political arm of, of the city government, you know, how they want to see things built. Um, the interesting thing about the strong mayor's bill, it will give the mayor the opportunity to prioritize what projects come to council first and how those projects move through council in an expedited way. And I actually don't think that's a bad thing because it helps us bring that kind of housing online more quickly. And that's not just market-based housing, that is affordable housing as well. I mean, you look at some of our colleagues that are in the affordable housing space, um, Habitat for Humanity, Indowell, they're sitting there in some cases waiting for permits to be issued to bring in some of that servicing that you're talking about. Um, now they have a mechanism to, to you know, lobby the mayor's office or local city councillors to help bring some of that online. How market. do they lobby a council? Yeah. They have no power. But that's not how it works. Power. But that's not I, how it works. I think so. I, I mean, you still have to get four councillors online. Josh councillors is can my councillor. Am Luke, I going Luke, to him Luke, when, Luke, when Luke, something Luke, goes wrong? Because he doesn't have any power. I, I just, I can, yeah. I mean, we, I'd love to have a coffee with you. And sure. sort of, you know, we'll, <laughs> get, we'll, get into, we'll get into all of this Absolutely. when we have more time. But you know, the reality is, first of all, even though your question was wonderful, it was on Bill 23. <laughs> um, you know, we have so many of these sort of fireballs being thrown at us that it is easy to sort of conflate them. And th that's why I said earlier, this isn't actually about housing Bill 39. This is about a power grab by John Tory and Doug Ford. Um, you know, John Tory will have, even with this new bill, will not be expediting permits. That's not the way it works. And, you know, the reality is, once again, Doug Ford could change things if he wanted to. He's deferring, he's actually neglecting his ability to do so. He's creating this gaslight red herring of a strong mayor power. And what we should be debating, frankly, is how to move forward with these priorities, everything to do with housing and transit, to getting the snow shoveled and dealing with the very, you know, clear municipal issues that we should be addressing better. And the raccoons, <laughs> especially the one at your house. <laughs> Well, he's not, but, dead, not dead yet, but he's going to get there. But but the very fact that after this municipal election, we find out that John Tory made this request, mm -hmm. that he got that request granted, and or it seems to be moving in that direction now, he is not disavowing it. And ultimately, what we are now debating is whether or not Toronto will be the only legislative body in the entire world elected that will have a mayor using minority rule powers is absurd, obscene, and wrong. Let me follow up on that with you, because you've, uh, Josh doesn't necessarily have the most positive relationship with Mayor Tory, if I can put it that way, <laughs> but you have a pretty good relationship <laughs> with like Mayor Tory, I think. So, yes. Yeah. Okay. So let me ask you, Yeah. why would he want this? Why would he put a target on his own back by asking for these extraordinary powers that no other, as Josh says, legislature in the world has? I, I'm not going to speak to why John accepted this and why he advocated for it if in fact he did. I don't know. Those aren't conversations I've had with him about this matter. Um, what I do think is that it leads to lazy decision making. Meaning what? I, meaning that, you know, the Ford government just, you know, they've just decided the green belt's now open for development without actually thinking through what that might mean. You know, now we actually have a home builders association that thinks the mayor can expedite permits, which they can't. It has people believe that we're going to actually have rooming houses approved, but they're not. And so all of it, it, it creates and feeds into a level of cynicism, which I think is really bad for the republic, body republic, as it were. Mm -hmm. And I think it's bad for decision makers and is bad for um, every level of government authority. What, and also what really is, from my perspective, the most damaging is the fact that we do have a housing crisis. And so while we're having this little discussion about what's going on here, we're not actually fixing the real issue, which mm -hmm. is how do we afford to embrace 6 million people in Ontario 
over the next it's not a small ten. thing. Uh, it's not a small thing. Just and because one, it's not just housing. Sorry, and I, yeah, and I will, please, yeah. Please, yeah. but it's not just housing. It's transportation. Totally. It's school. Why do you want to build an entire like new city within a city and not one ounce of money goes to education? And we need we need school capacity. We need child care. We need parks, infrastructure, right. which we have a dearth of. We need to be able to flush your toilet. But, but, and once but, again, but housing point, is the last list on the priority when we're talking not. about these things, it's right? Not. So Can we I agree on one thing, though, just, just to Karen's point, though, uh, on, on rooming houses, the irony is... Um, I think I heard a, a stat that John Tory, even with his meager, mm -hmm. relatively strong mayor powers that he has today, um, has been successful in roughly 96% of the votes. So the rooming houses vote may be the one kind of consequential one uh, that he said he didn't have the ability to get through. The reality is, with the new election being, being over, uh, we have the majority of votes to move forward with rooming houses. He's not lost on the 30 other housing-related items at council. So it also begs the question that you posed to Karen, which of course none of us really know the answer to, why would he request these undemocratic powers? Um, and I don't, know if, I don't know if anyone can answer that other than John Tory. But frankly, I think, you know, the city is moving faster and further with, enha with enhanced housing opportunities in neighborhoods than the provincial government is doing in Bill 23. The yep. city is moving forward with not enough, not good enough, but frankly far more than the province has on substantive uh, housing-related priorities. Luca, maybe you could help us with this, because uh, the conventional wisdom today is that the Mayor of Toronto asked the Premier of Ontario for these powers, and the Premier of Ontario, even though he didn't campaign on it, granted him this authority. Do you know that to be, in fact, the case? I, I can't speak to that. I'm not privy to conversations that the mayor would have with the premier. I do know that within the uh, provincial government, uh, prior to the election, there was a sentiment that a lot of um, priority housing initiatives may have moved through municipalities at a rate that was um, slower than desired, which could have contributed to a uh, supply issue within the province. Um, and there was a serious amount of discussion uh, you know, around how can we make these processes quicker. Okay, um, can and I you ask see... you a real smart sure. question as a follow-up sure. now? Absolutely. Okay, you used to work for Steve Clark. I did. Municipal Affairs and Housing Minister. Yes. The once and still. Okay, he used to be a mayor. He was. Can you imagine when he was a mayor, whether he would have thought this was kosher? I can't speak to that either. <laughs> I can't speak to that either, because discussions on strong mayor powers, to be completely honest, happened after my tenure in his office. Do you think he's totally on side with all of this? I think the provincial government is looking for ways to work with municipalities to move processes when it comes to home building. It's not what uh, I to, 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 you to think short, he's totally to on side with all of this? The they're short handing process the hot potato to help. back to municipalities. <laughs> That's what so they're doing. I can't speak to the, the political sentiment around the strong mayor powers within the government, because, again, that happened at a time after I was the chief of staff. Um, but I will say that the government has been focused on trying to find ways to shorten those processes that are related to building homes in this province this isn't the way. because there is a supply crisis in this country or in this province. We have to build 150,000 homes year over year for the next 10 years. It won't years. happen. And it to, won't put happen. It's not happen. to put it in perspective, the best housing start we had on record was in a year 2020, I believe, and we built 100,000 homes. So we have to increase that efficiency by 50% consistently over the next 10 years. So it doesn't surprise me that the province is looking at, you know, um, let's call it pretty pretty significant measures through Bill 3, through Bill 20, uh, 23, and through Bill 39 to move these processes along more quickly. Because the convention, at least at Queen's Park, is that there is some sort of... Uh, tension or delay in the system and that is happening at the municipal level. Now I can appreciate that there is a dis there there is more to that that argument and there's a lot of municipalities coming out and saying, well, you know, there are people sitting on um, approved lots, you know, the market is fluctuating, supply chain, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of what the government has done through Bill 108, More Homes, More Choice, okay. Bill 109, and Bill 23 has been focused on getting these municipal processes more streamlined and more efficient. I get it. I get it. But you're hearing considerable pushback on the table here, mm -hmm. on her radio show. Mm -hmm in the broader public, that this isn't the way to do it. Exactly. If this was the aim, is there a better way, let me ask you, is there a better way for it to have been done? I think there is a better way for it to be done. I mean, I think, first of all, you know, the province is ignoring its own housing affordability task force major recommendations in which, you know, increasing density in existing neighborhoods was the major theme of that report. Four stories and four units by right. And, you know, I do think that we suffer... It was dead on arrival, though, Eric. 
That was dead on a run. The, his former boss said there's no support for that yeah, right now. Yeah, and so he's talking about how bold, you know, he's being on housing and, you know, standing up to the NIMBYs, in which case, you know, the policy, the number one policy that was recommended, too bold. So, you know, is Steve Clark now the big banana? I don't know. But I think what we're suffering from in, in this province, and particularly at the municipal level, is a shortage of imagination. Because when it even comes to these changes, for example, to uh, development charges that are reducing budgets, well, the goal here really should be about, OK, well, you can increase the amount of development charges you collect by making sure more housing gets built. And you can reduce the amount of infrastructure investments that you need to make by ensuring that that housing is directed to places where ample infrastructure already exists. Mm -hmm. And if you look at Toronto, or if you look at Mississauga, more than half of neighborhoods are losing population. We have schools throughout the city that are at risk of closure because not enough children live near them to go to. So we have this huge misallocation of public resources and this huge lack of imagination about how we can get people participating to build housing. And one of the best ways you can do it is allowing people, especially older homeowners who've had families, they've seen their children move out and they would love to stay in their <clears throat> communities. And that gives them an opportunity to participate even in a do-it-yourself fashion okay. to contributing to yeah. solutions. Let me go over here though. I want to, uh, you talk to people every day. You mm -hmm. talk to lots of people, you talk to your listeners every day. I want to know if they're more upset at the notion of a four-story something being built in their neighborhoods to accommodate, I guess, the gentle mm -hmm. density that they call it, or are they more, uh, you know, are they offended at that notion, or are they saying, yes, build it, bring it on, we need more homes? What do you hear I, from people? Well, the sentiment is, just do it. I mean, to your point, thinking outside the box, we have hundreds of government buildings, whether it's federal, provincial, or municipal, and they sit vacant, and they do nothing for years other than collect dust. Those are the kinds of things that could be retrofitted, could be made into co-ops, could be made into affordable housing. That stuff doesn't happen, so they'll sit there for the next 20 years. That's a lost opportunity. If you want to solve a crisis, start thinking outside the box now and not 10 years from now. Bottom line is I think most people want to make sure that there's a process in place. Whereas I understand, I agree, we have to build up in Toronto. And there's so many opportunities. Every street corner, you should be looking at the building and saying, are there places above it? Can you build up? Yeah, there are. Everywhere you look, they miss the opportunity to build up by allowing just one level. But who do I go to as my counselor would be the concern. I think most people would say, if a rooming house all of a sudden pops up, let's say a developer's got four or five houses on one street that they were gonna develop, but now they've thought, you know what? I don't need the hassle. I'm just gonna make them into a rooming house. Maybe you've got a, a landlord that's not there. Who are we going to talk to? The council that has no power anymore to solve it? I think if there's no accountability and checks and balances, that will become a very big problem. Let me put this to you. Is there yeah. still too much nimbyism among you and your colleagues, which therefore justified the province bringing forward this measure? not justifying removing the basic tenets of democracy. Uh, I think it's actually really healthy for us to discuss better ways to consult, better ways to make decisions. And I think that we should constantly see our democracy as a work in progress and we need to make in improvements to it. But not to simply dismantle the basic tenets of democracy, which is that the majority rules and the minority is heard. I mean, that is the basic framework of a democracy in any elected body around the world. So, uh, no, it does not merit that. And frankly, if this government, the provincial government, was serious about affordability and actually addressing the housing crisis, they would recognize that it's their own doing that often does themselves the most damage. Uh, they, they removed rent control of all units, new rental units built in Ontario. Uh, they but are the blame threatening goes section. Back. Let's, let's be honest. The blame goes previous governments. It's not just like but, they've but, been but, all but, but, I'm, but, I'm, but, I'm, but I'm citing just the, the recent actions, and frankly, they're the government now that's making mm -hmm. Bill 39 mm -hmm. a decision. So, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they also are threatening Section 111 in the City of Toronto Act that would ensure that tenants who are removed from a building that they live in today because because of a redevelopment, have the right to actually afford to remain in their own neighborhood where their kids may go to the local school, if they're a senior, a place that they've known for all their, for many years, and in a place that they can still afford to live in rather than live, live in another community far away from home and not be able to afford to live here. It's one of the few tools we have in the City of Toronto Act that makes that happen. Um, there are so many things that they could do, and including not removing the city's means through DCs to actually contribute toward building affordable housing. Housing. That's going to have a big impact on the city's ability too. Um, you know, Bill 109, many other bills that they've passed affect the functionality of our planning division to be able to expedite 
uh, some of these, you know, these permissions that you are hoping for because there's not going to be anybody in the office because they won't be able to pay the bills. The reality is this government has a lot of rhetoric about housing, but they're not actually fundamentally doing anything to help in substantive ways. And frankly, what they are doing is rewarding donors who have bought, purchased lands on the green belt. They are uh, saying a lot of the right things, but doing all the wrong things behind the curtains. And one of the things that they've done most recently is allow John Tory's request to move forward, which is to have a, a power grab of he and eight councillors having control of a, of a majority of council, which is just fundamentally wrong. And I hope that we can agree, even you and I, that as Democrats, that is not the way we should be making decisions, regardless of what side of the decision we might be on. All I know is, when you two go out for coffee, I want to be at the next table to decide. I, look forward I to want to listen to that. To we're we're plumb out of time. We've got to get this group back and continue this conversation because I know it ain't going anywhere. Karen Stintz and Eric Lombardi on that side of the table. Josh Matlow, Luca Bucci, Alex Pearson. You can hear her on AM640 on the other side of the table. Great discussion, everybody. Thank, thank, you. thank, thank you very thanks, much. Steve. Thank you, thank you. Thanks, everyone. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.